and it was partly obscured by a much taller gravestone. And because of the way it was obscured, you could see four letters, and it was L-I-V-E. It says, live. And as I, as I moved around and I was able to see the rest of the gravestone, the word on the gravestone was Clive. And here this person named Clive was sending a message. And that message that he sent to me that day was, live. Welcome to the Thick and Mystic Moment with Robert John Hatfield. Here we explore critical tools and techniques for nurturing a mindset of change in your life. The video version of each episode is available on YouTube and other social media platforms. If you find these discussions valuable, please let us know. We appreciate your feedback. From the Tacoma Times, September 25th, 1941. Headline, Citizen Kane, Storm Center. Famous film now on Roxy screen. Launched in the midst of of great controversy and having created a whirlwind of sensation wherever it has been roadshowed. Orson Welles' Mercury production of Citizen Kane opens today at the Roxy Theater. Not like any other regular picture, however, Orson Welles, the producer, writer, director, and star of Citizen Kane has seen to that. The theatrical phenomenon who endured the taunts of Hollywood and its wits for a year while he was making Citizen Kane on RKO radio, radio's closely guarded sound stages, has justified the faith of his backers and confounded the hopes of his enemies by turning out a picture that has the critics babbling praise. They praise it for its radical storytelling methods, which pick clean the character of the man obsessed by a lust for power who could not humble himself even before the love of two beautiful women he married. They praise it for its bold innovations in lighting, settings, and photography. They praise it as adult in the same breath that they hail its great effect on the mass audiences of America. They praise it for its acting, done by names new to Hollywood, but not to Broadway, where the Mercury Theater under Orson Welles became overnight the new standard of theatrical thrills. And it is the actors of the Mercury Theater you will see in Citizen Kane. Good morning. Robert John Hadfield here. Welcome to today's Thick and Mystic Moment, broadcasting out of Utah South Studios in St. George, Utah. I read that article. I'm fascinated by Citizen Kane for one very simple reason. Now, if you're not familiar with Citizen Kane, which is hard to imagine, but, but it's considered by many to be one of the, if not the greatest movie ever made. And it came out in the early 40s. So it has been, it's an older show. And it was, it was produced, like it said in that article, it was largely just Orson Welles. I mean, he acted in it, I, he directed it, he wrote most of it. And it was his first movie, his first feature film. And it's considered one of the greatest films ever made. And I love that. There's something so fascinating about this idea that this person's first time making a movie became one of the greatest movies of all time. And and one of the reasons I started thinking about this, I, I stumbled across this interview with Orson Welles that I thought was so fascinating. And, and you can go watch the video version of this and, and the, way he, the way he explains himself is so great. But, but I've, I, have the, I have it here and I just wanted to read a couple things to you from this interview. And they were asking him specifically about this movie, Citizen Kane. And listen, listen to this. So the interviewer asks Orson Welles, 
What I'd like to know is, where did you get the confidence from to make this film? And Orson Welles' answer, I love this. Ignorance. Ignorance. Sheer ignorance. You know, there's no confidence to equal it. It's only when you know something about a profession, I think, that you're timid. (laughs) Isn't that beautiful and isn't that true? He has this utter confidence in all the things you can do in making a masterful movie, largely because he has no idea how to do it. Okay, well, it goes on. How does this ignorance show itself? And his response was, I thought you could do anything with a camera that the eye could do or the imagination could do. And if you come up from the bottom in the film business, you're taught all the things that the cameraman doesn't want to attempt for fear he will be criticized for having failed. And so so he says, and in this case, I had a cameraman who didn't care if he was criticized or if, if he failed. And I didn't know that there were things you couldn't do. (laughs) So anything I could think up in my dreams, I attempted to photograph. I love that line. I didn't know that there were things you couldn't do. Next question. You got away with enormous technical advances, didn't you? And then his answer. And this to me is the cherry on top simply by knowing that they were impossible. (laughs) You got away with enormous technical advances, didn't you? And his answer was simply by, by not knowing that they were impossible. Isn't that awesome? This this whole idea, he, he talks about the fact that, that he got all of his confidence from ignorance He got all of his confidence from not knowing that the thing that he wanted to do couldn't be done. And that was the beauty of it. He didn't know it was impossible and therefore it wasn't. Now, now ignorance is, is a really strong word here. And as I was thinking about this, I did a little bit of research and I was trying to find anywhere that somebody said something positive about ignorance because there just isn't anything because maybe, maybe that's not the the best word for this Uh, ignorance itself, because, you know, you hear the word ignorance is bliss, you know, not knowing something can actually, well, not knowing something can give you great peace if you don't know the thing you don't know. And, And so there is something to this idea of ignorance being bliss, but there isn't anything inherently really good about ignorance. So I wanted to maybe take that a little bit differently. And rather than using the word ignorance, maybe a better word to use would be ignore. Rather, so when you, because we we don't necessarily want to be ignorant about things, but there is something about the innocence that comes with that. And in Orson Welles' case, he goes, I didn't know that you, that we weren't, that these were wrong, that you can't do this, that it's impossible. And because I didn't know it was impossible, I did it. We have so many rules we put on ourselves because they've, they're rules that they've been passed down. We've been trained to believe certain things, to have certain ideas that, that this is wrong. You can't do it this way. That, that, that can't be done. It's impossible. We hear these kinds of things. And so because we've been taught them, it's hard to get rid of them. And we are no longer, we no longer have the luxury of ignorance in so many things in our lives, if that is a luxury. But you understand what I'm saying as we have this discussion. And so what we have to do to replace that, since we we cannot have ignorance in certain areas, in anything that we've learned about, Perhaps what we need to do is train ourselves to ignore conventional wisdom, ignore the traditional rules. And then that will give us the freedom 
if we can ignore them, the freedom that somebody like an Orson Welles has to do things that have never been done, to try things that have never been tried largely because they're impossible or you're not supposed to do it that way or that's against the rules. You, you know, one of the great examples that we've talked about before was Roger Bannister when he broke the four-minute mile. It was impossible. There were people that literally thought it was impossible to do. And amazingly, as soon as he did it, it was within a month somebody else did it. And then within a couple of years, it had been I think by now it's been done close to 2,000 times. But it took, as soon as it happened... Hadn't been done throughout history, but as soon as somebody did it, then everybody could do it, or lots of people could do it. And that same idea pl- uh, applies here. If you didn't know it was impossible, you could do it. And there are examples of this. There's so many examples of this kind of thing. And it's not just knowing that something's impossible. It's n- something that goes against conventional wisdom, something that's breaking the rules. You know, one of my, one of my favorite examples of this is George Harrison in the song Norwegian Wood. It's on Rubber Soul. And I think that this was the first time that a sitar was used in popular music. I don't know if, I don't know if it was the first, but it was right is before that had really been popularized. So they were doing this song called Norwegian Wood, which ended up being, I mean, one of their greatest songs, the Beatles' greatest songs, Norwegian Wood. Beautiful, beautiful song. I mean, the lyrics are incredible. The recording's incredible. And it has a sitar in it. You know that sound. has that unusual sound. And if you listen, George Harrison's talked about this. And it was... It was such a strange thing. And to us today, it seems so normal because we've heard that song our whole life that we've, we've kind of lost perspective of how original that was. Because today, it doesn't seem original anymore. It doesn't seem risky. But to them, it was risk-taking. <clears throat> they were taking an Indian, a traditional Asian Indian instrument and throwing it in American popular music. Well, British popular music that then was exported to America where it really, really took off. And George Harrison talks about this and he says, you know, I didn't even know how to play it. And so I'm handed this instrument and I start just playing these basic notes that just kind of follow the melody. And he, he, was, he didn't know how to play it. They didn't know if something like that was going to work in popular music. It was a total risk. And they were breaking the rules. The rules would say you don't take, you don't take traditional Indian instruments and throw them in the middle of Western popular music. But they did it. You don't take an instrument that you literally do not know how to play and put it in a professional recording that's going to be distributed to the planet. But they did it. And they made a massive hit. One of the most beautiful songs of their entire library. And then, and then, then uh, I, I, everybody started doing it. Matter of fact, not only did everybody start using the, the, uh, the sitar, an electric sitar was developed. And, and where have you heard that? Th- that was being used then in popular music. Uh, Do It Again by Steely Dan, which I think came out in like 1972, has an electric sitar in it. I mean, so here, here are these people that try something that had never really been tried before, took this risk, broke the rules, and then it became totally normalized. Something that had never been done before. Taking these Eastern instruments and putting it in Western popular music, and then within a few years, well, of course we do that. Everybody does it. So much so that we lose perspective of how original some of these things were. Another, probably my favorite example of this whole thing, is meatloaf. 
I don't know how many people remember really what happened there. But Meatloaf, they put out an album called Bad Out of Hell, and this was in the mid seventies. And it, and it, we we have lost once again perspective on what a big deal that was. Here we had this guy named Meatloaf that was this overweight stage actor wearing a tuxedo (laughs) and not buttoned up, wearing a tuxedo that looked like it was two o'clock in the morning after you'd worn a tuxedo all evening, waving this handkerchief around, singing rock opera style to a piano, a guy named Jim Steinman playing these elaborate uh, rock opera pieces on the piano. And, and that was, that's what they were bringing to the record companies. This is in the mid seventies. You know, this was, this was at the height of uh, all the, think of all the things that were popular back then. I mean, Led Zeppelin was a big deal, but you had all these different uh, British rock that was, that was all over the United States. You had the things that were going to be introducing what was going to become disco. You could feel the, that, that, that starting. You had so many different things, so much stuff, the stuff that was happening. And then these guys came in and you had this dude playing the piano, this rock opera. You had this overweight guy with this long hair, wearing a tuxedo, waving around a handkerchief. And that's what they were bringing to the record companies. And every record company they went to goes, we don't know what to do with this. This is too out there. This is too weird. You're you're not doing it right. And record company after record company after record company said, no. What, what, What are we supposed to do with this? This doesn't fit anywhere. And then a guy named Todd Rundgren heard the music. And he says, I think we can do something with this. And he produces this album, which became Bat Out of Hell. And it is filled with these, once again, it's kind of like this Broadway style rock opera music. And it even has this, this song, this epic piece of music called Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. And like I said, we forget how unusual this stuff was because now it's so normalized but you go back and listen to that song at the time it was recorded the lyrics the length of the song the the movements in the song they had a for heaven's sakes they had they have a whole section of the song that is a that's a that's a baseball announcer coming in and announcing a baseball game and this ended up becoming this classic song that now is legendary. And that album, Bat Out of Hell, that came from these guys that were breaking all the rules, all of the conventional rules of what was supposed to be popular at the time, they broke all of them. And Todd Rundgren comes in and allows it to happen and let, and breaks all of them with them and produces this, and it becomes what was the, at the time, the biggest selling album of all time. And it's still one of the biggest selling ever. It's, it's behind thriller, which is the number one and maybe a couple of others ahead of it, but it is still one of the biggest, some sold something like 30, 40 million copies of that album. The album that all the record companies turned down because they didn't know what to do with it because it broke all the rules. So think about the power of ignoring the rules, ignoring conventional wisdom. Now, does it always work? No. Probably most of the time it doesn't. But true greatness, it seems comes when you have the ability to do that. Like Orson Welles says, he, the confidence to make a movie like that came because he didn't know you couldn't do it. 
And if you listen to that article, why I loved that article so much is that everybody in Hollywood was sneering at him. What do you think you're doing? You, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know how to make a movie. You're a stage actor. You don't know how to make a movie. You're not part of the club. You're not part of us people that know how to do this kind of thing. And then he beat all of them. Because he didn't know. Because he didn't know the rules that the people in Hollywood did know. The people in Hollywood had a formula and rules on how to do things. And Orson Welles comes in and goes, I don't know any of your rules. I'm going to do, do whatever I feel like doing. And then he makes the greatest movie of all time. There's power in this idea of not following the rules, conventional wisdom. There's power in that. Obviously, look at what has been done by these people. And there's example after example of this kind of thing in the world. And it's been one of the things that actually, in some ways, I've had experiences with this in my life. I, I, when, when we, sometimes, in my band, I remember being in the recording studio and we had these ideas. It was, it's so interesting what we do to ourselves with this. Because here we are, in a moment of great creativity in a recording studio, and we had this song that starts out with this rhythmic, cool bass line. And we'd been playing this thing for a while before we took it into the studio. It just had this rhythm, cool bass line. And I remember we're getting into the studio, and we had all these different people that were involved with the band at that point. And we were told... When I say we, there was just this division among people in the band and people working with the band and me. And well, you can't do that. You can't start a song out with just a rhythmic bass line. Why? Well, no one does that. You can't do that. And I remember that going back and forth with all of us and different people in different positions, just on this one little thing. And I'm thinking, we're in the middle of this creative endeavor, supposed to be creative. And yet we're paying so close attention to what you can and can't do or what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And it becomes, it, 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 it becomes paralyzing when you start worrying about whether or not you can or can't do something, whether or not it's been, I've had other experiences like that working with people where, where the question I keep getting asked as we're working through an idea is, well, do you have any examples of where that's worked before? And my immediate thought is, no. And that's why I like it. <laughs> because I don't have any examples where that's worked before. So let's try it. And it's amazing how much pushback people have with that. Now, probably for good reason. And maybe the song with the rhythmic bass line was better the way we ended up doing it. I don't know. The, the thing that was frustrating for me, though, was this whole idea of why do we always focus on conventional wisdom of what you can and can't do, what should and should not be done? Because where do these rules come from in the first place? Somebody made them up. Somebody saw something that seemed like it worked and therefore they did it. But, but before they did that, they didn't know it was going to work. Everything that we have as conventional wisdom was a risk at some point by somebody. And it's so important for us to remember that in, in what we do, in our creative endeavors, in our business. From an entrepreneurial standpoint, Do I just copy everything everybody else has done? Well, sure, you can learn things from people, but you better figure out a way how to differentiate yourself. And so many of the people that have been truly successful, like the examples that we've given right here, truly successful, like really, really successful, are the people, and once again, let's remove the word ignorance and just use the word ignore who ignore conventional 
wisdom. I'll give you a really great example of this right now and how this could apply potentially to you. I know so many people, so many people, that want to write a book. They want to write a book. And they have this, these, this grand idea of what that means to write a book. I'm going to write a book. And it's going to be my life's work. And I want you to ask yourself a question right now. Because prob- maybe you've thought that too. Do you want to write a book? Well, ask yourself a question right now. What is a book? What does that even mean? This is a beautiful example of how rules get broken to the point that we can't even define something anymore. And yet, breaking the rules has created whole other industries. What is a book? It is possible that there are kids growing up today that may be surprised to find out when they go to school that books are actually printed things bound that you can turn pages. There are probably kids that will find that surprising that that's a book because their exposure to reading their exposure to books has been on a tablet or has been watching their parents listen to books. Well, I I meant to go read books when they're actually just listening to them. Imagine having a conversation with somebody from 60 years ago and you say, well, the only time I really uh, use books read books is when I'm driving. What? You mean when somebody's reading it? Well, no, no, no. I mean, when I'm driving by myself, that's, that's when, that's the only time that, that books are really a part of my life. When you're driving by yourself, what is that supposed to mean? Well, because of course we understand today you're listening to the book. It's an audio book. But ask yourself then, what is the difference then between an audiobook and a podcast? Well, one of them was planned. One of them was written ahead of time. Well, okay, well then what if you take your podcast and you make the transcript and you print it? Is that now a book? What, I mean, who, what made what? Where does, what, what is, what is what? How many, so then you start asking yourself, okay, well then a, a book it can be listened to, but it can also be an electronic thing. Go to Amazon. You can download ebooks, and the ebooks resize themselves. You can make the print larger or smaller, which means the book could be five pages and five hundred pages, depending on how big you make the text. So, are there any even rules on 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 how long a book is? Can a book be one page? Because as, as we start questioning these rules. You start opening up all these other opportunities. What does that mean to create a book? What, because we, because we can no longer even define what a book is, which then creates all these new pieces of our language, which is kind of fun because we have an audio book and an ebook and we have to make new words for these things so that we can communicate because using the traditional words for them if you talk to somebody from 60 years ago it would make no sense wouldn't make any sense to them what we're talking about so you have to say ebook you have to say audio book you have to say printed book we have to create these new words for them or communication totally breaks down Because have you been in a situation where somebody says, how many people have read a book in the last month? Well, I get, I mean, have I read a book? I've listened to a book. Does that count as reading a book? I don't know. Because this stuff changes. But the reason it changes is because somebody somewhere said, well, what is the rule here? What is a book? 
Well, a book can be all these different things, which is kind of awesome. And when you release yourself, so this whole thing about if you wanted to write a book, if you release yourself from this idea that a book is this this thing that, you, that my life's work and it's 200 pages and it's, it's this whole thing where I go through all, maybe it doesn't need to be that. Maybe the book you write is what you would normally consider the first chapter of a book. Go write, go write six pages of just stuff, something about your life. You want to know something? You can take those six pages and you can go on Amazon and you can put you, you, you can go publish those six pages and make an ebook today. You can do that today. All of a sudden you think, wait a second. Think about something you're good at, something you're talented with, whatever it is, anything. Could you write 10 pages about that thing? You know what? That, right there, those 10 pages could be a book by tonight on Amazon. You always wanted to write a book? There you go. Done. I actually experimented with this not long ago. See how far I could take this. What I did, and you notice if you listen to this, this show that I do, I frequently refer back to old newspapers. Here's what I did. I found an old newspaper... I found an interesting article from an old newspaper that I didn't write this article. I found an article. I did what's called an OCR, which is optical character recognition, basically converted the text from the newspaper into editable text. I QC'd it. I double-checked it to make sure that it was all done correctly. I wrote an introduction explaining what this was. Because it was published in, the, in 1917, it's public domain, so there's no copyright on it. So I took this text just to try it, just to see what would happen. I wrote an introduction, I, and I, then I took the text from the article, I put them in Word, cleared it up, cleaned it all up, and then loaded it to Amazon, and now... You can buy it on Amazon as a book that I didn't even really write. (laughs) And this is because I'm going through this whole thing like, what is a book? And then what I did is I took a microphone and I read it. And now I have an audio book from an ebook, a book, a book that will never be printed. It'll always be electronic. So is it a book? That's what we call it. But the, the, the point that I'm trying to get to, that this is so important in our lives when it comes to, especially if you're in the world of business, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're, if you're a creative professional in some way, Push those boundaries. Push those things. Ask yourself, why? Why do we do this this way? And there may be a good reason. And that's fine. But you got to be asking yourself that question on a regular basis. Why does everybody do it this way? Why? Why? And when you do that, you start finding that as you're pushing up against these different ideas, some of them aren't very strong. Doors, you can push open and go, hey, wait a minute, how come nobody's ever gone in here? And you go in. And there's this whole new world. And all of a sudden you have things like Citizen Kane and Bat Out of Hell and Norwegian Wood taking things that were never supposed to go together, breaking conventional wisdom, changing rules, ignoring rules. Well, I know everybody does it that way, but I think we should try something different. Cool. 
Try it. Now, most things, when you start breaking conventional wisdom, probably don't work very well. There's a reason conventional wisdom exists, because people have tried things and they function. But the point here is, if you want to do something revolutionary, if you want to change things, if you want to stand out, you got to do it differently. You got to find your own way to do things. Sometimes it's a slight modification on something that already works. And sometimes it's a dramatic, complete rewrite of a, an entire idea and everything in between. But look for that thing for you. Ask yourself that question. Why? Why? Why do we do things this way? Why do I do things this way? Where did that come from? And is it something worth holding on to? Is, a, is it a rule that I believe in? Is it a rule that works for me? And as you start questioning things like that, like, what is a book? What is a book? And all these other things open up. And then even in your own mind, you start thinking, hey, it could be this. What if I tried this? Maybe I could do this. How come, how come I, my mind says that, that this is what that is, but it could be all these other things. And I could actually start accomplishing really interesting goals if I quit going along with my preconceived notions of what something's supposed to be. Sometimes, sometimes we're at our best when we know the least. Thanks for listening to my ramble, my rant. <laughs> I hope you have a fantastic day. And as always, do something different today. <laughs>